Oh, Wendy, I don't know what to do. Hello, thank you for being here. My name is Chrissy Hodges and I am the founder and the executive director of OCD Game Changers. I'm also a certified peer support specialist here in the great state of Colorado, where it is severely windy right now. So if things start flying all around my head, including my hair, <laughs> it's because I have two windows open. <laughs> um, and I am also the author of Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Thanks so much for joining us today. And I'm so excited to have my guest on, Mr. Chris Tronson. Chris, introduce yourself. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. I'm excited. It's not windy out here in California or hot, but um, if I if I see things, flo if things float in my house, it's something entirely different besides wind. Um, no. So thank you so much for having me. So my name is Chris Tronson. First and foremost, I am an individual with OCD. Um, I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, also body dysmorphic disorder. And I think along with those two diagnoses came depression, anxiety, panic attacks. Um, that I dealt with for many years untreated until I finally was able to get um, a proper diagnosis uh, through a, an actual specialist that, that focuses on the treatment of OCD. Um, and I was able to get treatment. My treatment took around 14 months of hard therapy. If you include the support groups I was part of, it was about two years. Um, and after that, I just decided that I, I wanted to be an advocate and in different ways was kind of an advocate in, in the community. And then decided that I wanted to go a little bit further and start helping people in the, you know, in the community that were struggling. So I went back and decided to get a master's degree and work as a, a therapist. So it's been full circle for me, um, you know, going from, from somebody who suffered with severe, severe OCD, unable to leave the house, housebound, um, to now getting to a point where I get to treat clients that are also struggling with this, the same disorder. So it's been a full, full circle moment for me. So I'm just excited to be here and kind of, open up, be vulnerable, chat, answer some questions, whatever I can do to help the community. I think that's the most important thing right now is um, this community is already so misunderstood. I think because OCD is a silent disorder, so many people go through intrusive thoughts all the time, behaviors as well. And they have a lot of uh, lack of understanding from even family members and loved ones. And so having a community is important. And I'm glad with modern technology, we're able to keep that community going, even if it means things like this. Um, I think it's so important. So I'm just happy to be a part of it. And you are also part of our Game Changers family. Yay. You've been to two Game Changers so far. Spoke at the first one in 2019. That's where, if you all saw the photo. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. The photos. Oh, Lord, the photos. <laughs> Chris Tronson blew into Colorado freezing. And so we wrapped him in as many clothes as possible. <laughs> Yes, it's it's hilarious because out here, like cold is like sixty degrees. But when I showed up, and you know, I had I had prepared for it, so I overbought clothes. And when I showed up to that airport and tried to walk outside, it hit me like a fist. I was like, no. So I'm sitting in the airport, putting on layers and layers and layers and layers of clothes. Can barely see my eyes. I was just covered in freaking. So yeah, I don't know how y'all do it on a daily basis. It's crazy. We love it. We love it. And I think that almost the entire time I only saw your eyes because you were yeah. so <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. And yeah, just, for sure. And just being a part of it. Just a side note, that weekend was the biggest blizzard that came through Denver that that year. So you got an absolute dose of what it's like to live in Colorado. <laughs> right. I really got like, hey, this is the pinnacle. But the next <laughs> thing was like coming back for, the, for uh, this year's Game Changer. Um, conference. It was normal weather. It was fun. It was pleasant. Oh, wow. I liked it. Yeah. The last, the last event to take place probably in the entire United States before the world shut down. <laughs> well, I think that was, was so crazy. I mean, you and I, everybody speaking there, et cetera, we were really just talking. Um, and I remember a couple of the people, maybe because of OCD or family concerns, because they had health issues and stuff, were a little bit uh, you know, scared and a little bit worried. But at that point, it really hadn't blown mm -hmm. up. Yet. So I remember us like, no, we're doing game change. It's going to be fine. Everything will be okay. I literally come back home and almost like the next day, everything mm -hmm. started shutting down. So it literally was like the last event before anything happened. And I think that's just what's insane about how a month and a half, how quickly this had changed. And we'll obviously tie this back into OC later, but I think that's been what's been hardest for me and hardest for everybody is it wasn't like this gradual. It was sort of like our lives were one way one day. And then we suddenly were like, time out. Your life now looks like this. And when you have OCD, when you have anxiety, when you need that, that control that those two disorders usually bring upon us, 
there was no control. There was no prep time. There was no mental prep time. It was just like, boom, everything in our lives changed. That was insane. It was really difficult. You know, we will start the conversation there after I describe what fire chats are, because isn't that yeah. how OCD is? You're just living mm -hmm. your life and then boom, OCD hits and your entire life changes. So Absolutely. what an interesting comparison. But first, if you are joining us, thank you. Hello, everyone. I so appreciate you being here. Um, we are just going to do some chatting. So if we don't get to your questions, it's not that we're not getting to your questions. Sometimes we get caught up in kind of the dialogue. Um, but we so appreciate you being here. And thank you for commenting. Uh, fireside chats are something that out of the blue, I decided would be a good therapeutic tool for myself <laughs> and selfishly i use my nonprofit for it <laughs> but i did think in the first couple weeks of all of this going on there was so much confusion about how to feel and and what emotion was appropriate and what am i supposed to do and and how am i supposed to be reacting and i think that you know the the overshadowing answer is you cannot predict and every emotion is okay but that it's been such a blessing to be able to sit down with people in our community uh oh are we echoing let me put in my headphones just in case okay i can put mine in. oh i can't put mine in there in the car or you could just take the floor and i could run out to the car <laughs> um the, the only thing i ask is you do not judge that i'm not up to date with my ipod and i have like the old school like ear earplug one so just don't judge as long as there's no judging i'm okay everybody who's been on here beforehand with those are now thinking oh my god chris is judging me for having <laughs> <laughs> i know like as soon as this is all done the apple store is one of the first stops i'm getting <laughs> airpods so i don't keep looking like i'm living in the 1970s with my old cords and stuff <laughs> <laughs> oh, i think that's better actually so these fireside chats have been really helpful not only for me but also for people to hear that leaders in our community and people who are you know normal everyday people advocates you know people that are living with ocd people that are treating people with ocd all, we're all experiencing this together so that's the point of doing these fireside chats they've been phenomenal and helped so many people and they've also helped me in the process too so with that um i definitely think we had like a little plug into what it's like for life to change in regards to OCD. But first, I want to get to how you've been feeling, Chris. So um, one of the things we lead off with is what has this experience been like for you? And, and literally, we were together. And then three days later, it all fell apart. Yeah, it's funny because being a therapist during this time, I would say the majority of my attention has been, and focus have been on my clients. So I haven't had as much time to really like process my own stuff. Um, and it wasn't until I was actually seeing a client and they were someone who was doing a lot better before this hit. And all of it kind of came back to me. And I was like, wow, this is really affecting me, maybe in a little bit different of a way than than everybody else. So I'll kind of just just be vulnerable. So for me, the reason this has been so tough is, you know, I went through treatment myself. I it was it was the hardest point in my life. I would say prep me for anything. Um Obviously, nobody wants to get this virus. Um, I have kidney stones. I have sleep apnea. I have some some breathing stuff. So obviously, like I genuinely don't want to get it. I also do not want to give it to my family, any loved one. But besides maybe kind of like the general anxieties of the virus itself, that hasn't really been what's been difficult for me. As someone that's been in recovery, who's finished treatment and lived a really solid life, this period has affected me on kind of like more of like an emotional, like deep level. I would say the first thing for me is that this is what my life looked like at my worst. I was housebound and the only time I was leaving my house at all was there was a 24 hour Ralph's by my house and I would go on Sundays at like three in the morning and I'd go into the grocery store because that's when everybody was gone. Less contamination, less me need to check and just all the other subtypes that I was having. And I would go to the grocery store at three in the morning and shop for the essentials for the week and then be housebound for the week. And so to me, this experience has brought me back mentally into that point. And I think what's so insane about it is like you put it behind you. And, it, and I think part of the payoff of treatment was always like, this is the only time I'll ever have to deal with this in my life. Like that was a horrible moment. I never want to go back to it. There was a suicide attempt, there was isolation, there was depression, there was disconnection from family and loved ones. I mean, it was a low, 
but I've always been upbeat because I'm like, man, that is kind of like my past. That happened over a decade. You know, that was a long time ago. I don't ever have to go back, but now I do. I mean, obviously the, you know, intensity of OCD and all the other disorders I have isn't there, but this idea of needing to isolate, barely leave your house, only leave your house if you need groceries. I mean, it's really putting me back into like the worst state that I've ever been in. And so I find myself at times like, not flashbacks, I'd say that's too strong of a word, but emotional flashbacks. It's sure. like, man, I remember this, like sitting in your house and just being like, okay, I can't leave. And so I think that probably like first and foremost has been one of the main kind of um, conceptualizations that I've had to kind of overcome is just like, yeah, you're, you're sort of back living how you did when you were, were at your worst. And this was promised to you that this would go away and now you have to live through it. So I think that would be like the first and foremost way, you know, it's been impacting me. I think it's such a good point. And Chris, I've been noticing, you know, with the not that it was kind of a novelty when this first happened, but everybody was in such shock when it first happened of the, is this really happening? Kind of yeah. what I would imagine the zombie apocalypse would be if it happened. Like, <laughs> right. <if they're> really <laughs> zombified. Exactly. And if they bite yeah. me, am I really going to die? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but once that wave was over, then it it comes to, uh oh, this is the new reality. And I'm just going to get a little bit vulnerable and just raw here. It's, in the last few days, I've seen a lot of posts about people being suicidal and people who have lost their lives already because we have expired that first deadline of April 27th, where we kind of, you know, it was like the end goal. You know, it's like the, okay, here we go. We just need to get to the 27th and then things will open back up and I can go back to my routine and I can go see the people that I love. And then now all of a sudden each state is going, oh, wait. No, we're not going to. We're going to extend it 10 more days. So if we think about someone who's living with depression in symptoms and they are going, okay, the relief is April 27th. And then also all of a sudden the field goal is moved 10 mm -hmm. more days. As much as like people who do not experience just that internal feeling of depression, anxiety, and mental health symptoms do not get it. It mm -hmm. is, it is the, I'm hanging on by a thread because I know on April 28th, I'll be able to go do this stuff and boom, it's taken away from you. And so all of a sudden now we find ourselves in this really scary time for people of, can I make it another 10 days and what do I do? Absolutely. I mean, we all, it, it's probably different state for state. I know for me in California, it was like April 1st, then it was moved to April 15th. Now it's moved to May 15th for us. And so it's like exactly what you're saying is I think everybody with mental health difficulties is trying so hard to say, okay, let me be in the moment. I know that mindfulness and presence has always been something my therapist or the community has really pushed out there. So let me just get through today, but back of our minds thinking like, okay, at least this thing's going to be done in a couple of weeks soon. And then when that data's come and pass, it's like, oh my God, you know, there was a, a head nurse that just committed suicide. Um, that's been in the news, yes. you know, for, for, you know, I hope I don't trigger anyone, but but for my own kind of suicide attempt, I think what was harder to harder for me than the actual like obsessions and compulsions and everything is once it, it you know OCD and and related disorders consumes your life to a point that you no longer can just like function, you you isolate, you become very like by yourself and lonely, and that depression and isolation takes a whole new toll, and it just makes you feel unloved, uncared about, and obviously there's you know, social media and there's, there's online stuff. And we can maybe talk later, like the things that I'm personally doing to try to stay in like positive and, and happy spaces, but it's still not the same. It's still not the same as being able to sit down with your friends, sit down with your family, going to the beach, going to the stores. And even if some States are opening that up, there's such a still like level of like caution and fear that maybe the average person doesn't go through. But with our overactive fear mm -hmm. states in our brain to us, there's like, I hear a lot of my friends, colleagues, clients who have OCD and related disorders, like they could open up tomorrow. I'm not going out. <laughs> like I'm done. Like I'm scared. Yeah. I'm not ready to. Um, so you're right. I mean, I just think that that isolating component going back to kind of like that first point I was making is that's, I think, you know, that, that level of like just isolation and being at home and loneliness that you experience um, when you're at your worst with OCD, like now people are having to experience that all over again. And so people that have been going out of the house as part of their therapy, part of their recovery, part of their treatment, that's been kind of snatched away. And, 
yes, you can get creative with different ways. And we can maybe talk about that later, like creative ways to still do exposures and get out and stuff, but it'll never be the same as how it was before. Um, it, it, it's just not, it, it's, it, it's not going to feel the same as it did when there was no restrictions or nothing going on. Yeah. I think that the comparison is, well, adjusting to, adjusting to the new normal will and can happen, but it is very much to me and hearing you talk about your experience and being isolated. It, that brings me back in this reality to hanging on every single day, hoping the symptoms would subside. You know, when I didn't know I had OCD for 12 years, I just thought, uh, you know, I had scrupulosity. So I just thought God was punishing me with whatever I'd done wrong. And so I, I would just hang on every day, hoping today will be the day it will break and it will be better. And so, um, you know, just to kind of spin this into positive, you know, not that we have to be positive, but just, you know, it is a heavy topic. It, it's. I just want everyone to know that it's been hard for me too. Our governor has, we, we had the stay at home order and then he pushed it back another 10 days. I think it's like May 7th or something like that. And it's now safer at home, which in some counties, including mine, there's it's strict regulations. Um, but it's still like, Oh my God, normal isn't going to happen. I'm not ready to accept the new normal, I guess, at this point, but I still feel very isolated. And so I just want everyone to know that you're not alone in this. It's I was waiting for April 27th to come for them to be like, OK, we're going to start opening up restaurants. And whether you're judging me and saying that, like, I'm, you know, I want to kill people, whatever. Like, <laughs> I'm thinking from the mental health side of things, you know, and being yeah. responsible and staying six feet away from people or whatever I need to do. But I also know people need those options. They need the ability to know that they can get out of their house, whether they're in a domestic abuse situation, whether or not they're trapped in their house with, with kids and a family and they're having sexual or violent intrusive thoughts. Like we do need things to, to be a little bit more accessible. So if you're feeling stuck, I'm feeling it too. And I just want you to know that. Yeah. And, and for me as well, I mean, I get a lot of my energy from being around people. I mean, that's where a lot of my mood comes from, my boost and stuff, like being able to spend time with friends and family. But even as a therapist, I love sitting with a client. I like working with a client. And obviously I'm still doing that, you know, via uh, telehealth, but it, to, to me, it's not the same, yeah. but even with friends and family, I mean, you know, my, um, you know, family is Greek and, and Greek Easter and then traditional Easter happened, which we also celebrate on my dad's side. But it's like both of those holidays I love. I've always loved Easter. I've always loved that holiday. We get around and it's more than just like eating. It's like spending time with family and I have Greek traditions that we do. And it's just like a really important time. And we, we for, you know, had to forego it this year. And so it's just like, those are kind of the things that I look forward to. They energize me and stuff and those be, be taken away. What I've also learned is like, like you were saying earlier, there's no right way. And I'm hearing from myself, from a lot of people like judgment. And I think that's one thing that I hope people recognize too, is that you know, your feelings are going to come up and be organic regardless if you want them or not. Um, and instead of us trying to like change them to look like what people think, um, it's, it's you know, recognizing like your feelings and your thoughts are coming up because of they're coming up and, and not that you have to be a certain way or act a certain way. Um, and one of the, su the support groups I co-facilitate, like one of the, the, the people in the group had read a quote and I don't know it verbatim, but it basically said like, hey, during this pandemic, if you don't learn how to cook and learn a new language, it's okay. Like, I think there's this expectation, especially coming from like celebrities and stuff, like learn a language, clean your house, like, you know, get in great shape. And, and I think that's great if you live in a community that's not affected, you don't have family that's effective and your mental health is strong. But I think for a lot of people who are struggling, they don't have in their minds like, oh, I want to bake a banana bread. Like that is completely out of our mindset, Susan. Like we're, we're just trying to kind of like function. So I think, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow and her like push for all of us to like learn languages and, and make a spring ham. It's like, look, girl, like some of us are just trying to get through this mentally without going crazy. Like I, I don't have time for your, you know, your recipe. I don't care if you put a little bit of paprika in your omelet, like leave me alone. So I think that's just a big thing as well as being able to recognize, like, don't have expectations. Your workouts aren't going to look the same. Your, your, you know, family time won't look the same. Your holidays, your, your, your time with friends and stuff, it's going to look a lot different and accepting that and being okay with that versus trying to fix it or change it or push away certain feelings and experiences. Um, <laughs> 
Paprika. I, uh, <laughs> I agree. And I also want to bring up the point of one of the things I've also been seeing. Um, and this is why I love the fireside chats. Cause it's almost like we're doing these chats as things are evolving. And then like, yeah. you hit, like I, I, how many waves of judgment have we all been through? Well, here's another one. When people yeah. are getting on, like right now is the time that people would be going to senior proms. They would be, yeah. you know, getting ready to graduate. Um, you know, people are, we're supposed to get married. This is springtime. This is like the biggest yeah. wedding season. Yeah. And all of a sudden, like I had a friend the other day, Debbie Shear. Um, I wish she was on here. And if she was, yay, shout out. She's awesome. But she was talking about how her kids, they always go to the summer camp. And she got like shit on her Facebook post of like, whatever, you know, you should be staying home. And, um, you know, why are you grieving? Cause it's saving lives. And it's like, uh, uh, no, we're not going there because it is okay to grieve. I mean, I am grieving the fact as stupid as it sounds like I go to the same restaurants every week. Yes. That might be compulsive. <laughs> <laughs> Order but the same thing by the same waiters. <laughs> so what? <laughs> Anyway, um, yes, I do. But it's still, I love that. And I love that part of my routine. And I can't do it. And as sad and stupid as it may sound to everybody, like I feel grief about that. Mm -hmm. That's part of what, like during the week, the things that I look forward to and I can't do it and it makes me sad. And then when other people are losing these milestones and then all of a sudden you get on, you know, a social media argument about how you shouldn't grieve because you're saving people's lives. Stop. Just stop. Yeah, my favorite word is end. And I, I don't think the American public knows the term end. It's always like, or, you know, and so I think that you can grieve. Like, you know, I did see a post, uh, you know, obviously I'm not going to prom this year. That'd be very um, creepy. But, um, you know, it, you know, somebody was posting like a, a, a it was like a family friend and she was posting about how like her kids are sad because they're, she has um, twins and they're not going to make their senior prom this year. Oh, I and imagine. yeah. And somebody commented like her, my family friend didn't write like, Hey, I hope um, you know, like no attacking, just like a basic statement. Like my sons are sad, et cetera. And somebody kind of attacked her. Like you said, like, Oh, well, bigger things are going on. And once again, it comes back to that end. It's like, her sons can grieve that their senior year prom, Absolutely. the things that they talk about in every movie and every film and everybody always talks about and discusses and you look forward to, they can grieve that that's gone and understand that they're doing it to save lives. Like it can be a both, it does, you know, it can be both. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be one or the other. And so, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have felt guilty discussing the things that they're kind of sad about or missing out on our grieving. And we always feel like we have to throw in there, but but like I understand, we're saving lives, we're helping. It's like yes, I'm an 83 year old grandma. I have I have health stuff myself. My mom works at a hospital. She's in her 60s. Like I'm, I do have a lot of fear, and I'm thankful that we are doing this because when this is all done, my hope is the least amount of people were affected, and I can be sad that I can't see my clients in person. My best friend was going to get married like late March. Like I can be sad that. This is something he's talked about for years and I was going to be there. Like we can have those end experiences where we mourn something and understand and mourn for the families. I think a lot of times it's like we almost have to have layers of, well, my my grieving is higher than yours. So therefore you can't grieve and grief shouldn't be. We're grief police. We always want to tell everybody how they should grieve or they're grieving too much or too long. And I think it's just everybody can have their experience and their feelings. Everybody's allotted to that. It's our rights to to have our experiences and not be judged for them. I love the grief police. That's the right? best term ever. <laughs> it is. It's literally like, I've seen it before. You know, you, somebody will have lost somebody and you're like, Oh, when did they die? And it's like, Oh, there's an acceptable amount of time to still grieve like a year and sooner. But if somebody's like, yeah, they died about 10 years ago, it's this attitude. Like, well then get over it. I'm not saying, oh you know, God. obviously if, if someone's passed, like you want to get help. I'm not saying it, it's healthy to necessarily like, not be able to function decades after a loved one passed, but somebody can still be moving forward in their life and, and building their life back up and grieve someone that's passed. But we do, we have grief police. I want to get little stickers and put them on people that do it. <laughs> grief police. <laughs> How dare you? You cried too long because your dog died. Grief, 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 grief. You know, there's like judgment. It's crazy. So. Well, I don't think that's what's happening now. And, and um, that it, it's all of a sudden we're getting to this, this comparable who 
this just comparable society of who's right and who who's wrong and why if this person isn't doing that and this like my husband has asthma and yes he could be susceptible and things could go bad if he got covid but i'm going to tell you he also cannot function with a mask on you know it, it's 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 hindering his breathing it's making him more anxious it's making all this so when he goes out in public and doesn't have a mask on that you know and but you know he he's risking getting you know, yelled at or judged or whatever. When in reality, if you just sat down with someone and said, Oh, by the way, I'm not wearing a mask because I have asthma really bad and it's going to yeah. exacerbate my symptoms and not to mention my anxiety. And then it would be like, Oh, okay. But we're, we're at this position now where it's just this, we're hanging on to this, but then there are other issues arising for people and nobody's willing to see, no one's willing to meet in the middle, I guess. It's very black and white, which I think for people with OCD, this is not going over well because we live in this realm anyway. The last thing yeah. that we need is society to be swinging the pendulum back and forth, right? Yeah, I agree. And I think right now, I mean, it sounds cheesy like a Hallmark card, but I think if we just had way more like support, loving and understanding, I mean, there are people buying toilet paper on toilet paper on toilet paper on toilet paper. Like you can't even wipe your butt that many times in a lifetime, but there's no co there's no conscious like understanding that there may be a family out there that has none. So it's like, yeah. you know, for me, I know like I, I have to use a CPAP to sleep. It's like, I have enough, um, you know, I have to use distilled water for the machine. It's like, I have enough. I'm good for, you know, for a couple months. Like I don't need to go every time I go to the store, buy more and more that means that somebody else out there can't have it so i think that we need to have a lot more just understanding love and support um for each other and and you know you had asked earlier how it's affected me i think one of the other ways that it's affected me too there's kind of like three main ways yeah. um but but another one is that for so long you know when you are struggling there's like the sick and then there's the norms and i always wanted to be a norm because it's like man they go to the beach and they date and they just have fun and here i am being sick and my life sucks and so you know when you have ocd it's like you can go out and you can see how people function and there's a little bit of you that's thriving to be like that it's like okay i want to get to that point one day i want to get to a place where i can just go to the beach and not think about it and it's it's insane for me to see people doing the things that i was taught by my therapist not to do you know, people wearing gloves, people yes. wearing masks, people yes. you know, like walking down an aisle and somebody like scurrying away from me. I mean, those are the things I did all those years ago. I was the mat, I was the the aisle scurrier. Like I'd be an aisle holding a product that was gonna, you know, clean and save my life or whatever OCD was telling me in the moment. And somebody would come down that my OCD, the OCD deemed as like dangerous or scary. So I would like run out of the aisle and wait for them to pass wait a couple minutes for the air to clear and then go. And I'm like, now I'm seeing other people do that. And I think that that's been hard too, is because I want to shake everyone and be like, no, you guys aren't supposed to do this. Like I already did this. It's, it's horrible, but obviously I'm not judging. I completely understand why they're doing it. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be, but I think that's, what's been also like a mind trip for me is just, I never saw when I was at the store, people were judging me, you know, my like cleaning, my wiping, my things that I would do like in public at a store, and, you know, I used to clean my money before using it. And now people are cleaning money. It's just, it's, it's now hard. Now it's to, trendy and acceptable. Yeah. And so when you, when you for so long kind of looked at everybody as like normal and you wanted to be that, it's kind of like, it, it, it feels flipped. It's like now everybody's doing, everybody's living how I used to live and I don't like it. You know, I, I, I lived it. I don't, I think the other thing that's really trippy about it is like seeing people. I mean, when you're doing those compulsions, like I never saw myself from like a bird's eye view, you know, I, I always saw it outward. So I didn't see what I looked like walking into a store, walking around, like, you know, scanning, buying items, wiping them down, like going home, cleaning them, spending hours in a shower or, you know, avoiding people. Some of my intrusive thoughts made me avoid people, but you know, just all that kind of stuff. It's like, I never saw what it looked like. And now actually seeing it on display and seeing other people doing it, it's like, oh my goodness, like, you know, I was probably more intense than all of them, but that's what I looked like. And it's sad. It's like the first time I've seen in my face what I looked like when I was sick all those years ago. So that's been kind of like really, really heavy on me as well. Mm -hmm. What does that feel like for you to, what is your experience like when you're seeing everybody else do that? You know, whether that brings up the, the desire or the need to want to do that or 
you know, like meaning, are you wanting to go back into that or are you just feeling more, no, I'm going to continue to do the exposure piece of it. Uh, what does that feel like for you? What's the experience like? Yeah. So lucky for me, like, you know, when you go through treatment and you really go to recovery and then being an advocate and a therapist, I mean, I'm doing exposures with clients all the time. So there isn't any of me, like I've been definitely following my mom works at a hospital and has been giving me CDC guidelines. So I'm definitely wearing like a mask and I'm, you know, social distancing and I'm not going when it's extremely busy and, you know, I wear gloves if I feel like it's necessary. So I don't have watching them. Like there's no part of me that starts to then go, okay, well, let's do what they do. Like I haven't been wiping down anything. I haven't been doing that stuff. For me, it's more so like, you know, I, I almost imagine it like if you were somebody who was like on meth and then recovered, like looking back at your old pictures or videos of you on meth, it probably is like, oh my God, who is that person? Mm -hmm. And I don't have that. Like I never recorded myself doing compulsions. I, because of body dysmorphic disorder, I, I have almost no pictures from like a gap of my life. So I don't always, I have one picture um, from like a birthday where I'm going like this and my hands are just like red and just like cracks everywhere. Um, and then there's another picture. My sister's like, I could see it in your eyes. So I only have like one or two pictures from like really hard mm -hmm. times. So I don't really remember what I look like, felt like, et cetera. So seeing people do that is like the closest that I can understand to seeing what I probably looked like back then at the store. Now, obviously it was different because it was, mine was more extreme. Plus I was the only one in the store doing it. Um, but just seeing people, it's been that experience. It's like almost like seeing my, my former self. I was like, wow, I looked like this. Like this is mm -hmm. the first time I've like seen it in my face and it's bringing up a week. I can't even describe the feeling. It's just like, oh my God, like this is probably what I looked like all those years ago, struggling in yeah. public, you know? I bet. Um, before I, w I definitely want to make sure that we get to the third point that you wanted to make, but I do yeah. want to ask this because I think it's really important. And of course, someone that struggles with OCD um, and is, is having kind of this internal experience and also a therapist. <sighs> Tell me what you think it is like as someone who lives with OCD and also someone who treats OCD for people who have contamination OCD, who've been working with therapists for all of these years who are saying, don't do that because it doesn't work and it's just irrational and it's egotistonic or whatever else. And now all of a sudden, OCD therapists are doing yeah. all of these things. Yeah. What? Tell me, I, mean, I don't even know what I'm asking. I'm just bringing it up and then tell me what you think in the future, how that is going to pan out for ERP when someone's like, well, I'm, you know, going to, now I need to wipe the door handle down because I'm worried I have AIDS. And then there, and then the therapist is like, no, that's irrational. And then the person can be like, yeah, really? You were wiping down your groceries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it is. I mean, one, of, one of my main subtypes when it first hit, I mean, mine transitioned into harm and sexual and relationship. But my main first one that probably like ruled my life in the beginning was contamination. And so the things that they're asking people to do now, like those were just norm behaviors. And it's funny because it kind of ties in my third point is basically like I was taught by my therapist for so long not to do these behaviors. And now I'm asked to do them and going through that treatment process of like, no, don't do that. It's almost like they have a place in my head now that they're bad. And now I'm having to like pull them up and almost be bad because I'm doing these things that I was told not to do. Um, it is difficult as a clinician. I mean, I, I, I understand that it's like the whole way I was doing treatment before this hit it's like, I can't do that anymore. You know, I can't tell people like touch a door handle and then spread it and like spread it on your clothes and like don't shower, you know, until the next day that that just wouldn't be like ethical and safe and I wouldn't do it. And so I have with clients with contamination, I've had to pull back and they have asked me, they're like, well, you always told me that this was stuff I shouldn't do. And now I'm being told to do it. Mm -hmm. So the one thing that I've really been trying to like, you know, push out and, and really have them understand is Two people, one with and one without OCD can both shower. And the person with OCD can shower for 10. And the person without OCD can shower for 45 minutes. It doesn't mean that the 10 minute shower is better or that the 40 minute is bad. It's what was the motive? What was the reason behind it? And so what I've been trying to explain to them is like washing your, your um, like door handles, you know, eight months ago, the whole motive was a what if possibility and fear. 
now we have a real reason and the brain can decipher the difference. So if somebody is cleaning now, their brain understands, oh, he's cleaning because this is the direction that he's been given. These are the safety information he's been getting from the CDC and other reputable sources mm -hmm. to stay safe during a pandemic. But just like people in the, you know, in the 1918, um, you know, almost 100 years ago pandemic, people then in the 50s didn't keep doing those things because, you know, 30 years ago, there was a pandemic, like, right. there was a real danger there. And that's what I try to explain to my clients is if there's real danger, you may still be doing compulsions. And we just instead of eliminating compulsions, we just reduce it so that you have norm behavior. And norm behavior is a range. I mean, everybody kind of does things differently, but we want to fit into that kind of norm behavior. Right now, you have a real reason to do these things. So if you're doing it, your brain understands versus if three years from now, they have like a vaccine, they're like, it's not a problem, et cetera, et cetera. And you're still doing those behaviors. Now your motive or your why is no longer pure. It's not because you're keeping yourself safe. It's you're living in those what if possibilities that OCD is presenting and now giving in is just a compulsion. The other thing I'm really working on people with is like, let's say somebody is washing their hands for 20 seconds because that's what CDC recommends. I have clients that are doing three minutes and I'm like, okay, we don't have to eliminate hand washing, but do you recognize that nowhere have they said wash hands for three minutes? Let's go to the norm, which is which is you know uh, 20 seconds. To answer the last part of the question, like what do I think will be like after? Yeah. My hope is that we get a very resounding like all clear. Like I hope it's not wishy washy because you know if this is up in the air for a while, I think it's going to be really difficult. But let's say we get an all clear, and they're like, we really have antibodies, we understand it, we have a vaccine, we know more about it. This is what we can now do to stay safe. What I'm going to work with on my clients is, okay, let's let's recognize like what is kind of norm behavior for you now that there isn't a resounding pandemic and let's get to that and let's do exposures to get you like that because the fear that has made you do these certain behaviors currently is not something that may be around in, in, in the future. So I think that it always comes back down to motive. I ask my clients a lot if they're going to do something that seems like a compulsion. I'm like, let's just talk about it. What's the reason behind it? What's the motive? What's the why? And if it comes back to OCD says, oh, keep me safe. So I'm doing it. That's when we want to challenge it. If it's because, hey, my whole family decided we live together. We have somebody in our house that's at, at risk. We all agreed to do this to keep them safe. That motive is very different. So I think going mm -hmm. to the why behind it is going to be what kind of always keeps us out of doing things as compulsions versus doing them for, for needed reasons. Well, a clarifying question would be, um, you know, just from a therapeutic perspective and someone who has OCD, I know what works for me, but, you know, do you have any suggestions on how people can decipher whether or not it is OCD saying this or not? Because as we know, OCD feels so real, we get in the thick of it and, and it is just, you know, oh, this, these people are doing this, so I should do this. A great way to put it is how do you know it's OCD and, and, and or shoulds? Yeah. Or, you know, do you have any advice or any um, tips or any of that? Yeah, I always remind people there's definitely a difference between assurance and reassurance. So in this case, a lot of us don't just know. We didn't grow up with uh, an understanding of what you should or shouldn't do during a pandemic. It's just not something that we come up with. And so right now, people may need assurance. They may need to you know, go to a website, they may need to ask a family member or a trusted individual. The reassurance component is if you're asking them the same question four or five, six times, mm -hmm. multiple days, etc. Um, so I know for me, like in my own life, because I want to make sure that I'm not doing anything extra, you know, I've, I've kind of made a pledge to myself that I won't engage in compulsions. Um, so I, I asked my mom, she works, you know, for a hospital, she has CDC information. And I'm like, hey, mom, I'm noticing that I'm seeing people consistently, you know, talking about this or that. For instance, like some people are constantly sort of like wiping down their own countertops. I live alone. When I come home, the first thing I do once I set my stuff down, I wash my hands. And to my brain, it's, we're all clear now. Like, you know, our hands are clean. I'm the only one that lives here. I don't have to worry about spreading germs because I just washed them or the virus. I just washed them off. But some people are like consistently maybe three, four times a day, like going through and like cleaning countertops and door handles in their own home. So I asked, I'm like, is there anything you've seen that I need to do that? So for me, it's not reassurance because I don't know. Um, it's just getting clarification yeah. from her. And then once she gives me that clarification, it's like, okay, then I'm okay. I can move forward. 
I think if you don't have an individual in your household that um, you can know or you can trust, um, like I said, going to, to like the World Health Organization, CDC websites and just checking in on that. I'm telling people like definitely have a news drought right now is not the time to have the news just playing for like three hours a day, like in background, it's going to drive you crazy. Yes. Um, so do a quick check in in the morning, check in at night, 10 minutes. Is there anything new? Yes, no, move on. I think it also comes back to just level of like intensity and severity. So if you accidentally touched a door handle and then you touched your clothes and then you threw your clothes on your floor and now suddenly you want to shampoo your entire floor because it might have COVID on it. That's when I'm starting to say like, okay, do you recognize mm -hmm. the intensity, the overestimation of consequence and danger that's going on? And what are maybe those loved ones around you doing? Do you feel like maybe your solutions are a little bit more increased or, or intense than the average person? So I'm not big usually on people kind of checking in with others because most of the time when they're checking during treatment before a pandemic, it's on stuff they for sure already know. Um, but right now, you may need to do a little bit more check-ins with people because a lot of us don't know. And new information is constantly coming out all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I love what you said, though, is it's that at the beginning of that, which is the making a commitment or going ahead and, and deciding what you're going to do. Because for us, it, for me, especially when I'm dealing with OCD and it's bothering me and I already know that compulsions are going to be there. I commit to what I will or I, what I can and, and want to do at the beginning of the day. So mm -hmm. if it's okay, I, at some point today, I might get triggered. I know I'm going to want to Google. Then my commitment is I'm only going to Google at 10 AM and 4 PM for 30 minutes. So yeah. that's the, the commitment that I'm making to myself versus the, well, I'm not really going to come in. I'll just see if I can deal with it when it comes up. Well, it's going to come up. Hey, I mean, yeah. it's OCD, and that's what's going to happen. So the commitment level of what are some of these sites telling you to do? What are they recommending? Um, whether that be mandatory or not, what are they recommending? And committing to that every single day. Okay, if I go to the grocery store and they're recommending that I wear a mask, I'll wear a mask. When I come home, they're recommending washing my hands, but not wiping down all of my groceries, which they're not recommending. Um, then, then commit to that before you go. And then there's no argument when you get back of what you mm -hmm. should be doing. I think that's so important. I don't know if it was, was on Game Changers or somebody else was talking about this exact same topic, but I think it is important is making that commitment when you're not in the fight or flight state. Because if you come home and you kind of, you know, just go into it and then you get triggered by something and then suddenly you're like panicking, it's going to be harder in that moment to say, okay, this, this is too much. But if you, like you said, have that commitment, like, okay, when I get home, I have a temptation to go on my phone and watch TV of the news. I'm going to cap it at 15 minutes so it doesn't turn into a compulsion. So I'm going to set an alarm for 15 minutes, see if there's any new news, any updates, anything that they're coming out with. If after that 15 minutes or you know, before is always good too, that alarm goes off, it's like school, drop pens, move done, turn off the news. Okay. I can watch it for 15 more minutes tomorrow, but not today. I made that commitment. Mm -hmm. I think that was really important for me is, is, and that's part of the reason I think my recovery went so well is, you know, once I was done with treatment was I told myself, I'm like, I'm going to imagine myself sitting at a desk and anything that comes across it, that's OCD. We are rejecting it. We are rejecting it. Now I'm not saying I'm perfect hundred percent of the time, my whole recovery process, there was definitely times that things snuck in. But when you have that overall commitment to that, um, as well as daily specifics. You know, if you mm -hmm. are going to the grocery store and grocery shopping, have a very concise and specific goal when you get home because there is that temptation to start, you know, cleaning everything. And then, like most of the time, what happens when you give into compulsions? I don't know if it's happened in your state, but I know they were saying, like in California, there's been a rise of CDC calls now of people getting uh, sick from all the contaminants or decontaminants and cleaners because they're in their house cleaning all day. And so yeah. people are ingesting that or it's seeping into their food. So it's like, okay, you know, wanting to recognize that that's a problem as well. So if your commitment is I'm not going to wipe everything down except my fresh fruit because people are touching it and stuff. So I'm going to wash that. Great. Stick to that commitment. And if you can't fully commit to like not wiping down your groceries, maybe you do it once or maybe you do it with a little bit of alcohol yes. and water and a, and, a, and a paper towel 
if you need to, to, to cut it back a little bit, that's great. That's fine. You know, you, you have a goal. I think it's just not having any plan each day of what you're going to do to push back against the OCD. And this goes for any subtype. I mean, let's say you were saying earlier, like, let's say you are at home and you have children in the house and you don't normally do it. And you have, you know, pedophilia OCD as your subtype. It's yeah. the same thing. It's like, I'm going to commit that today. I'm going to come out of my room and I'm going to spend 15 minutes at least with my nieces and nephews. Yeah. I'm going to play with them. These are the safety behaviors I'm going to drop while I'm doing it. This is how I'm going to make sure I don't white knuckle it. And then this is really the response prevention I'm going to focus on after. And what happens is now it's on your terms. You're being proactive. Mm-hmm. The treatment is on your terms versus just kind of waiting and sort of mm-hmm. seeing how it happens. So I think mm-hmm. that's important for all subtypes. I do just want to say and clarify that everybody should always wash their fruit and their vegetables. I don't care if COVID is a part of the world or not. And I have gotten so much shit from people (laughs) through the years because I have washed my fruit. And I'm going to tell you, I have been in the grocery store enough to watch people picking out the grapes and eating them right then and then putting it back. I'm like, "Uh uh-uh. Like, this is not even OCD. It's not even COVID. That is bad behavior. And I'm judging and I'm shaming people that do it. No, you say that. And it's so not not ha-ha funny, but ironic funny. It was like three weeks ago, I was out. There's a place called Sprouts. I don't know if everyone has them, but it's this market. Yeah, those are my favorite. They have the best registry chicken ever, by the way. They do. I love everything about sprouts. I'm going to move in. Uh, But no, I saw a guy in this current time state reach in, grab a few grapes and eat them to see if he likes them. Apparently he didn't. So he didn't like take the grapes with him. So luckily somebody reported it to someone. I was going to be the Karen, but somebody else did that, like reported. And they escorted his butt out. And then what they had to do is they had to take, because they didn't know exactly which pack it was. They had to take like all the grapes in the area and throw them away. And I'm like, why would you do that? But no, the reason I don't even think about washing fruit is I've, to me, like fresh fruit and vegetables, because I live alone, last like four minutes. So my stuff is always frozen. So so to me, <laughs> it's always frozen. And I just like, like saute my fruits and, or my vegetables and my fruits. Like I like frozen for smoothies. But no, I'm sure because I've seen people touch every fruit. And I'm like, okay, you don't need to like 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 massage the cantaloupe to know if you like it like calm down <laughs> calm down I, 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 but i will say that i squeeze all of my avocados before i get them okay so but people I'm are having to wash them, them because of you because i'm of you. not licking them and putting them back i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna tell you uh, this is a horrible story it's gonna trigger everybody i don't care because i want you to i want to just push home that you should always wash your vegetables i was in the store one day and I'm doing my thing over here. This was years ago. And I, I hear this kid yelling and I look over and you know how like all the mist comes out and, and so all yeah. the fruit looks fresh and beautiful. I look over and there's this little kid, probably like five, four or five years old. He is licking all of the broccoli. He's licking the mist. Off no. of the bro- I was like, no, I just stood and stared with my mouth completely agape. And the mom was like, come here, little Johnny, let's go. And she no. didn't do anything. She just left no. that broccoli. I was like, never again will I ever get a piece of broccoli right there in the front. You always get them from the back. This yeah. is not OCD. This is just don't lick the broccoli. No, I'm telling you, it's, 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 and it's, what's, this is totally <laughs> different on a tangent, but then the parents that just kind of like, no, don't do it. It's like, no, I mean, don't beat your kid, but like, you need to make him know that that was not okay. I don't want to get my broccoli and know that Timmy licked every piece of it. I would have made Timmy eat that entire thing of broccoli raw right there. like And pay for it, it out of his dang allowance. <laughs> <laughs> you're washing our car for a month to make up for that broccoli I had to buy since you're going around licking it. <laughs> I am having some justification now of all the people that make fun of me for washing all of my fruit. And yes, I wash it with soap and I don't care. And now I'm like, bitches, whatever. <laughs> Isn't there, don't, but the, don't they, I always see it by the fruit. Don't they, they sell like a special like fruit and vegetable wash. They do, but I just wash it with soap. And I know that that's probably worse. <laughs> right? <I'm> like, <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> you're going to have, they're going to be like, how come there's literally dial chunks like in her intestines? <laughs> why why is there so Timmy's bubble? I know. If Timmy would just not touch every food with his tongue, we wouldn't need to wash our stuff with shampoo or with uh soap and water. Oh my god, anyway. Let's blame Timmy for everything. <laughs> it's his fault. Everything. Probably 
probably was grown up Jimmy that was eating the grapes and sprouts. <laughs> right? You met him as a child. He came <laughs> as an adult to California and started eating the grapes. I was flabbergasted. I was just like, that did not happen. And luckily a girl like acted right away and then they took care of it like ASAP. But he was like, he was like surprised they were kicking him out. I'm like, sir, are you, maybe he just doesn't watch the news. Maybe he just thought everything's been fine. No. COVID or not, people do that all over. It was, I was in Safeway like a few months ago and I'm sitting there watching as two people are picking out the grapes and putting them back in. I'm just like, what are you doing? It's disgusting. Yeah. It's disgusting. Yeah. It is. I'm telling you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, so that was a good little lesson in washing fruit and I feel justified now and I sh sufficiently shamed everyone. So anyway, what are your, what are your other oh, thoughts? Well, I wanted to add real quick, like one thing that I've been working with too is because like there's been, uh, clients that I'm working with and their families that don't have OCD are saying, Hey, our family's doing this. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to come in and kind of, cause I don't work for the CDC and I don't want to go into my family's. Uh, you know, to my clients' families and say, well, tell your mom, nothing says that on the internet. She shouldn't be doing that. So once again, I think to answer your question a little bit more depth, it's like, I'm not trying to stop family norms. I'm just making mm -hmm. sure my client is is not going above and beyond. So for instance, for you, if, you know, fruits and vegetables is something you wash, like that's that's fine. That's always okay. It, it It's more so, is it causing avoidance? Is it causing distress? Is it causing like, you know, a significant time of your attention and energy? Are you avoiding eating the foods? When you go to people's house, do you ask them or do you wash their food? When you go to a restaurant, I mean, you know, people can do certain things as long as once again, it comes back to the motive. Like if it's just like, no, I wash my fruits and vegetables because I see people touch them. I think everybody would agree. Boom, that's fine. So I think that's why it's so important to always come back to like, why are you doing something? Well, I'm just going to go ahead and, and just admit that I do it because it's compulsive and I fear vomiting. <laughs> So, Timmy, if you're watching, I want you to attack every single piece of fruit and vegetable that this woman knows is going to buy at, at Sprouts. Get the parts that she can't wash off. And then that way she can face her fear. <laughs> Look, I'm totally being honest. <laughs> no, 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 no. Honesty is key. And once again, like, I think it always comes back down to, you know, some people are just at a point where they're not, and it's not shameful. They're just not ready to face a certain subtype or a certain fear. And I think if, you know, if people feel forced into it, they're not going to, they're not going to get better. So when you are ready, I will support you in eating that fruit and vegetable without washing it and just I taking it. I ain't never going to be ready. Never. <laughs> it's not Probably happening. one of those things you just do. Yeah. <laughs> Timmy, you Forever. scarred me for life. <laughs> we got to come up with a name for Sprouts guy. <laughs> He's doing it on an adult level with Timmy as a young, maybe they're like a team. They go state to state. <laughs> they just go state to state and do it for everything. You know, trying to keep people with ERP on their toes. <laughs> That's awful. But um, anyway, we are like right at four. So I, or six, what, wherever you wherever anybody is. <laughs> so, I know for me, it's three o'clock. Yeah. Um, okay, Chris, give us your final thoughts. Um, and typically, you know, it's it's just more about what do you want people to leave and, you know, this chat with knowing or, or you know, what do you, what do you want to help encourage people with in regards to your experience and, and giving them some hope? Yeah, I mean, I would first say, um, I, I think the biggest thing people need to do right now is recognize that one of the things that ERP is asking, one of like the core elements, if I was trying to sell ERP to somebody, one of the core elements is an ability to, to adjust and adapt. And so OCD is extremely mm -hmm. rigid. And right now, OCD rigidity is going to come out stronger than ever, and it's going to try to control more than ever. And remembering the very principle of OCD is, or ERP treatment for OCD is that ability to be flexible. So I think really kind of recognizing that you know, I, I'm having people that are like, my church services aren't how I usually have it. My workouts, my ERP even, right. and, you know, my I can't do the same compulsions. I mean, same exposures for compulsions anymore. I feel like I'm sliding backwards. And you got to remember, like, part of ERP is asking you to adjust. Now, adjusting to a pandemic is intense and it's very difficult. But being able to adjust to something like that, it is going to build that muscle of flexibility, that muscle of adjustment stronger than ever. That's my hope. That's my silver lining is like once this whole thing is done, 
if people have really been able to keep their OCD enough at bay, you're going to have created a, an ability to adjust up here that anything, I mean, I can't think of something bigger than a pandemic that's going to come up. It's never going to override what you've done. And so I think that sometimes it's hard during treatment to think of sort of like that long game or bigger picture. But my big picture to you would be like, if you can with, you know, withstand this period, not give into compulsions all the time, you're going to come out with that ability to really adjust, adapt, be flexible, um, and really just accept uncertainty stronger than you ever have been. So people need to hold on to that. That's kind of our, you know, I think of it as like our armor, our sword to fight back is that ability to deal with, with, uncertainty and accepting the unknown. And so if people can really strengthen that right now at this time, this will not be for naught. I'm not concerned about people baking cakes and like going on, you know, like, uh, you know, Skype dates. I mean, all those things are great and everything, but I think what's more important is definitely making sure um, that you really massage those principles of accepting uncertainty. If you're trying to control things right now, you're not gonna be able to, and that's gonna just keep us in that, that obsessive loop. I think other things is things like this. I mean, what you're doing at OCD Game Changers is huge. I mean, right now, I can only imagine if this was me when I was struggling at my most. I mean, you need support, you need community. And, and we always understand each other and we always got each other's backs because we are living it. And so if we have that ability to do things like this and to reach out and to support in the community, I think it's so important. So, you know, I'm telling people, if you're at home all day, like fine, there's multiple places that are doing things like this. Tap into game changers, tap into the others as well, and making sure that you're getting community support. It's what's going to help with isolation. Back mm -hmm. when I was at my worst, I mean, that was what I didn't have. I was isolated. I didn't have that community um, and that support. And even just getting a diagnosis and treatment and eventually finding a support group, it finally gave me that community I wanted so badly. So those are some main points. Um, you know, other things that I'm telling people to do is you utilize technology to keep in contact with friends and family, um, you know, making sure that you're checking in on other people that you care about yes. to make sure that they're okay. Um, and having a couple people in your own life, whether it's people, you know, in real life or people you've met through, um, you know, events like this, like making sure that other people are reaching out and checking in on you and making sure that you're okay. So all of those things are super important. Yes. And I also want to add to that. It is okay to tell people you're not okay. Mm -hmm. We do not have to have everything together during this. It's okay to tell someone I'm not doing okay. And, and the reality of that is you may not even know what you need. You may not even know what you want. Uh, and you don't, you may not even know how someone can support you. But the first step is just telling someone I'm not okay right now. And then maybe engaging in a dialogue of what is going to help. And if you are getting to a point where you are starting to think about suicide, you're starting to think about harming yourself, please, 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 please reach out. Please don't go through this on your own. I know what it's like to be suicidal. I am passively suicidal often, and I have survived the suicide attempt. Um, I know what it's like. The more isolated you get, the more you fear you're going to be a burden, the more you fear that there's no help out there. Please reach out. Please tell someone and just engage in the dialogue because just bringing it out in the open sometimes can provide so much relief. Um, so it is OK right now. You don't have to feel like you have everything together and that everything in your life is perfect. All of us are struggling right now. And, and just to you know emphasize the adaptability the, the, the things that we're going to come out of this with, we already have. And you may not be feeling this, but OCD or some, people with OCD are some of the most resilient, adaptable, creative people to, to, to be able to deal with what we live with in our life every single day. So while I know the pandemic is, is adding a lot onto us, please don't sell yourself short. You've got what it takes to adapt. You've got what it takes every single day to face this. And you've got enough strength to be able to not only get through this um, with yourself and your support, but living with OCD and being able to adapt and come out of this stronger. And we are with you and we are walking alongside with you. 
Yeah, if I can, I mean, brilliant points. And if I could just add, you know, one little thing to that, I mean, it, we are in such a social media society where, but even before social media, I mean, we're just in a culture where it's like, you know, how was your meal? Everything was great. How was your day today? Everything is great. It's like, we don't tell people publicly, like, I'm really struggling. Um, mm -hmm. And we definitely don't do it on social media. Everybody's posting their you know, picture from the Bahamas, but nobody's, you know, taking pictures of themselves on the floor crying because they're struggling with mental health. And so yeah. um, I think right now, more than ever, it is okay when somebody asks you, how are you doing? I think there's a collective <laughs> understanding if you're just like, you know what, I'm not doing okay. Like I miss this or I miss that, or I haven't seen my family in weeks, or, you know, I'm really worried about my aunt because she's, el you know, elderly, or I'm worried for my own well being, or I'm really bummed out. I was doing great in treatment and things are sliding back. And so if you don't feel comfortable and co confident, maybe to tell that to strangers or telling that to certain family members, then definitely finding community events like this where you can talk to other people going through it because it is so important to be able to just say, I'm not okay. Here's what's going on. And you'd be, I think people will be surprised at the overwhelming amount of like love, support, and compassion. Definitely certain people in your life or certain people in the community will provide for that. There's such a belief that we're always supposed to be okay. It, no, it's okay to just say, hey, I'm struggling today. I'm hard, having a hard time. Here's what would really help me. If you if you can give it to me, if you can, I understand, but this is yep. where I'm at. Yep. You know, that's what's so powerful. Well, thank you, Chris. It's always yeah. such a pleasure to hang out with you. I always have so much fun. I wish you would yes, come out here right. and live with us for a month. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as long as I can stay in our favorite place in the world, a courtyard Marriott, I will move out there tomorrow. <laughs> if you have a soup plantation, because I'm secretly 85, so if you have a soup plantation and I can eat there regularly, I will be the happiest person. So those are the only two things I need in life, and I'm good. I'm fine. As long as Sean could come visit you and have the blueberry pancakes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh my God, exactly. I miss Courtyard Marriott right now. <laughs> right? I miss a lot. I like soup plantation. I don't know when buffets are going to ever be open. So I'm going to have to figure out how to make my own Jones Broccoli Madness or eat soup or, or something like that. Because, man, I miss that right now. Me and all the 97-year-olds eating all of our vegetables together. Like, that's my place. And it's done with. There's no stew plantation open in like the tri-state area. So I'm kind of just letting it go right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Love you. You are such yeah. an inspiration. And we are just so appreciative that you're part of our Game Changer family and look forward to collaborating with you more in the future. Yeah. Anytime you need anything, let me know. It was super appreciative of this. And I hope everybody who watched got something and who watches later on when it's up, will get something from it because I think there's a lot of good stuff. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And thanks for everything Game Changers is doing for the community yeah. at this time. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for all of you who have been here, um, who continue to follow what we're doing. Um, this Friday, we will be meeting with uh, Dr. Amy Mary Askin. I hope that I said her name right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she'll be coming on and we'll be doing a fireside chat then. Um, really appreciate all the wonderful feedback we've been getting. Um, it just helps to know that we are a community, that are we are walking through this together and every single one of you matters. And we want to make sure that any place, any feeling, any anywhere that you're at, that you know that you're not alone. I know Chris and I both have gone through emotional up and downs during this time. And so we really need you to know that we're in this together and that you don't have to do this alone. Reach out for help if you need it. Thank you for being here and we will see you on Friday. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye.